Go ahead. Enzymes. Enzymes are proteins that increase the rate of chemical reactions by lowering their activation energy. Without enzymes, the energy needed to start a reaction is fairly great. With enzymes, the reaction rate, the energy needed to start the reaction rate is a lot lower. So this actually makes it a lot easier for many chemical processes to occur. Remember, when we talked about proteins, proteins are strings of amino acids that fold up into either a beta pleated sheet or an alpha coil. Those coils or sheets form subunits which make one whole protein. That protein is functional and then it can work as whatever it needs to, including enzymes. An enzyme binds to a substrate in a way that makes the reaction more likely to occur. So here's our enzyme. And you have to keep in mind that in real life, enzymes are 3D. They're not flat like I drew them. The enzyme, each enzyme has an active site, and that active site is what the substrate binds to. For example, here is an enzyme, lactase. Notice that it has an ASE as the ending. A lot of enzymes do end in ASE. Not all of them, but many of them. Lactase can break down lactose, which is a milk sugar. This milk sugar, lactose, breaks down to glucose and galactose. Now, if you're someone who's lactose intolerant, your body doesn't make enough lactase to break down the lactose. The key to an enzyme's activity is its 3D shape. The shape of the enzyme is what does what confers its function. So here we've got the active site on the enzyme, which again is 3D, okay, and that is where the substrate is going to bind. So here is an active site. Notice that this one can actually bind a molecule that has uh, some chemical bonds. And each substrate can only bind to one type of enzyme. So for instance, this enzyme right here could bind a molecule that looks like this, but it cannot bind a molecule that looks like this. Now enzymes aren't perfect. They can be affected by different things, and every enzyme has an optimal range where it functions best. Enzymes can be affected by temperature, by pH, by substrate concentration, and by enzyme concentration. So here on our graph, we have two enzymes that are used in the, uh, in the digestive system. Pepsin, which is found in the stomach, and trypsin, which is found in the small intestine. You'll notice that pepsin, on the chart, reacts best when it has a pH of around 2 or 3. Tristan, you'll notice, needs to work at a less acidic level. Its optimal functioning is around 8 pH. Another enzyme that you find in the mouth is amylase. Amylase is what breaks down starch. So for imagine for a moment that you're chewing on a piece of bread or a cracker. Amylase is the enzyme in your mouth that breaks down those starch molecules into smaller sugar molecules, so you're basically pre-digesting your food in your mouth. Amylase, in terms of temperature, its best functions at about 40 degrees Celsius. So that's its optimal range. For most enzymes, they're going to have a range where they can function best. If you go above or too below the temperature or the pH where those enzymes function best, those enzymes are going to start to unravel, and that's called denaturing. So remember that. When an enzyme is not in its optimum range, it can't function as well, or it may not be able to function at all. Here's an example of substrate concentration. So we have a bunch of these little red substrates, but we only have two enzymes with which they can react. So these enzymes are going to do their job the best they can, but it doesn't matter how many more substrates we add, those enzymes can't work any faster. So at some point, they're going to reach what's called a saturation rate. There's going to be a point where they just can't do their job any faster. Like if I gave you 20 pieces of candy, and I said, you've got 20 seconds to unwrap these pieces of candy, you might be able to do it. But if I gave you 200 pieces of candy, and I said, unwrap these in 20 seconds, there's no way you're going to be able to do that. 
So enzymes have a physical limitation. Over here we have enzyme concentration. So we have a higher number of enzymes per substrate. These enzymes are going to continue to do their job effectively as long as there's substrate available for them to act on. So the rate that the enzymes can act on the substrate is proportional to the amount of substrate available. Enzymes can work more efficiently when cofactors are present. Enzymes can actually also be shut off temporarily by inhibitors. So these are molecules that uh, can turn off the enzyme so that it doesn't work because there are certain times when the enzyme might need to do its job and certain times when the enzyme is not needed. There are three kinds of inhibitors. Competitive inhibitors, non-competitive inhibitors, and feedback inhibitors. Competitive inhibitors are inhibitors that look like the enzyme substrate. So here is a lookalike. If this binds to the enzyme, then it competes with the regular substrate for uh, the space, the active site. Non-competitive inhibitors are ones that are going to bind to a different site on the enzyme. This is called the allosteric site. If this competitor binds to the allosteric site, it's going to change the shape of the active site. And the active site will lose its, sort of its attraction for the substrate. So the substrate no longer can bind as efficiently to the enzyme. The last kind is the feedback inhibitor. So here we have enzyme A is producing a product. And that product is going into enzyme B, and which is producing another product. And that product goes back and acts on enzyme A. And it can act on it as, say, a feedback inhibitor. So this could uh, have a process that starts out, and the product of that process is going to go back and shut off the first enzyme. Cofactors, just so you know, can include things like vitamins and other substances that help the, the enzyme work more efficiently. So if you're taking your Flintstone vitamin in the morning, you're doing your body a lot of good. <laughs>